I'd like to thank everybody for coming uh, to today's webinar uh, covering optimizing business processes with apps. Uh, Dan, my, uh, my fellow uh, webinar host today, and I will be taking you through a number of, um, a number of exciting uh, slides about how you can use uh, apps to support your business processes. Uh, I hope you can all uh, see my screen. And um, yeah, without further ado, we will get started. So we've got a pretty packed agenda today and it'll take up about 60 minutes. Um, uh, the agenda will cover uh, a quick introduction uh, to Fliplet and, uh, and your hosts. Um, we'll then, I will then talk about uh, business process apps. Uh, so what are they, Fliplet's capabilities, how Fliplet compares with other workflow solutions in case you're familiar with other solutions in the market and wondering, uh, you know, should I change or, or should I consider using Fliplet for my upcoming uh, workflow project? Uh, a couple of quick case studies and then a short recommendation on how to produce workflow apps. Um, just wanted to point out that I'm not going to be going into a demo today about how you can actually use Fliplet uh, to produce workflow apps because I'm aware that some people who have joined today's call are already familiar with how Fliplet works um, and, uh, and that might be a little bit tedious for them. But if uh, people on the call today uh, would like to know how to use Fliplet, um, we're more than happy to organize a separate call with you. Uh, and then we'll have Dan from Sente. He'll be introducing himself and Sente advisors uh, covering what Sente believe are ideal Fliplet use cases uh, for uh, workflow apps. Uh, also some items to consider before using Fliplet and then some use cases that they've recently been involved with. And we'll have Q&A at the end. Um, we are using Zoom, as I'm sure most of you have noticed by now, um, and we encourage you to post any questions you have into the chat. Uh, I've got my colleague Chris, who should be on the phone, and he'll be reviewing the chat messages as we go through today's webinar and posing them to us at the end. Um, there shouldn't be any reason why uh, you need to come off mute uh, throughout the, record, uh, the call, uh, and we are recording it because, um, of course, not everybody can always attend this time in some other markets. Um, so without further ado, uh, who am I? Um, so my name's Ian Broom. I'm the CEO and one of the two co-founders of Fliplet. Um, and Dan, would you like to briefly introduce yourself? Sure thing. Uh, this is Dan Pryor. I'm principal and CEO at uh, Sente Advisors. I'll go through a bit more of my background and uh, what made Ian think that it was a good idea to bring me onto this call today uh, a little bit later on. Excellent. Thanks very much, Dan. Okay, so a brief overview of Fliplet. So Fliplet is a, an app builder. As you can see here, this is a picture of our online tool. Uh, it's mostly drag and drop, um, and most of the apps that people want to produce with Fliplet are already created on Fliplet, so most of the features that people want to include already exist. Um, and customers can also extend Fliplet by using common web technology coding programming languages such as HTML5, CSS3, and JavaScript. Um, Fliplet includes a broad set of existing features that can just be reused, customized. All of the branding and content settings of all of these features can be configured without touching a single line of code. So we have a large number of apps uh, produced uh, on Fliplet by people who don't know how to code at all. Uh, and a small number of apps require somebody uh, with more technical skills to get involved. Apps can be distributed across all major platforms. So they can uh, they work across desktop, mobile, and tablet. Uh, they can be distributed on Android and iOS app stores. They can be distributed across enterprise app stores. They also work as responsive web apps. Um, and you don't have to distribute apps via app stores if you prefer not to. You can also distribute apps as standalone files. Uh, one of the great things about Fliplet is you don't have to set up servers, you don't have to maintain your apps, you don't have to figure out how to use the app stores. Uh, we do a lot of this stuff for you. Um, and I'll go into more details about a lot of these capabilities as we dig into workflow apps uh, later on in this webinar. So what are workflow apps? I thought I'd just start with a bit of a definition because I'm aware that sometimes uh, people that I speak to are unsure about what a workflow app is, um, which is kind of why we used uh, business processes when we were promoting this webinar. But ultimately, uh, business process apps or workflow apps are, are often interchangeable. So workflow apps manage a series of steps or tasks between humans or software to deliver a business outcome. Um, and I'm sure you would agree that that is a very broad, quite generic, uh, a definition, which I think is also testament to how many different workflows and different scenarios exist inside a modern day business. Um, 
Uh, when we're speaking with customers, we've had them produce uh, workflow apps covering very simple things. Like at the moment, we're producing um, a, uh, a catering ordering app uh, for a number of customers, uh, particularly to avoid overcrowding in their catering uh, uh, areas of their buildings, uh, such as canteens in relation to COVID-19. Um, and then we've got other much more sophisticated workflow examples, which I'll go through with you later on. So let me explain uh, Flipplate's high level uh, workflow app capabilities. Um, so broadly speaking, we break this down into six key areas. Um, the first is the ability to collect data. Now this is critical. Uh, this is usually done through uh, the likes of a, a form, but as I'll go through in more detail in a second, we support lots of other data capture capabilities as well. Um, the key thing about Flipplet is you can collect data on any device. Uh, so this includes smartphones, tablets, uh, uh, web browsers, computers, etc., And you can also collect data from internal users or external users, also known as staff or customers in most organizations. You can also assess and enrich data as data goes throughout through the workflow app. Um, so this is often uh, in the form of assessing what should happen next in the workflow, such as analyzing the data, determining its attributes, and then deciding uh, who should I uh, kind of uh, get to, to do the next stage of the workflow. Um, it can also include enriching the, the information uh, going through the workflow with third party systems. So a really simple example of this is uh, putting in your zip code or in the UK, your postcode um, and it or the app automatically figuring out, oh, okay, that means you're in this area, will automatically fill that in for you. And of course, in some workflows that may actually change uh, who has to do the next step. The third stage is notifying users. This is very important. Not many people are going to engage with your workflow app if they don't know that you're waiting on them. Um, and one of the great things about uh, Flipplet supporting all the different platforms it supports is it's not just using email as a notification method, but it can also use push and SMS. Um, push being the most popular one when using mobile apps. Uh, the next stage is reporting, um, AKA uh, dashboards. Um, so, so reporting in Fliplet can include metrics, tables, and charts. Um, and we also offer uh, the ability to search, filter, or sort your information. Um, and you can even save uh, your search, filter, sort preferences uh, into uh, your own custom reports as well. So very extensive set of capabilities there. The next stage is the ability to export data. Um, this is particularly important in the legal sector where a lot of people uh, expect that their workflow app is gonna produce files such as Word, Excel, or PDF. Um, but data can also be exported to other systems such as databases and APIs. And then finally, um, and, uh, and, and kind of um, almost uh, an element that sits in parallel with the entire workflow is this concept of security users and roles. Um, and it's critical that not only a user is identified uh, successfully, um, often organizations would use something like single sign-on to identify a user, um, but also users must be allocated to roles because you don't want to be managing what each individual user can do throughout your workflow app, uh, particularly if you've got a lot of potential users. So what you would typically do is, is batch users into roles or groups is another way you could describe a role. Um, and then you would be able to allocate them different responsibilities throughout the workflow. So let's, let me run through a bit of an example workflow with you. Now this example workflow, and I apologize um, if anybody's having trouble seeing this, um, I've tried to squeeze quite a bit onto the slide, um, but don't worry, I will be talking through these stages and a lot of the really small text is repeated as well. Um, but this is a bit of an example workflow. Now this is an example workflow that I think most businesses will be familiar with. It relates to uh, NDAs, um, but it's also a legal specific workflow. So let me walk you through it. Um, and then I'll describe uh, what the app could be doing to support this workflow. And then I'll talk about uh, the different capabilities that are utilized. So starting on the far left, you've got the NDA requested via form. Now I've suggested that this could be done by the client or the customer via a mobile app. Um, what would then happen is that the app would store the information and potentially generate the first version of an NDA based on the parameters that have been entered by the customer. And it would trigger an email and push to be sent to the next person in the workflow. In this case, I'm suggesting it could be a paralegal. The paralegal receives the notification, logs into the web app. Because they're a user type paralegal, they would then be asked to review the NDA. Um, 
and they can upload an updated version of the NDA if they need to. So they would be able to review the information from the client and review the document that was generated by the app. After the paralegal has then uploaded an updated version and potentially provided any other data that's required, um, the data would once again be stored. Um, the Word file would be uploaded by the paralegal and an email and push would be sent then to, for example, a lawyer. A lawyer would then basically perform the same process that a paralegal did, almost double checking the paralegal's work in this example, um, but also being able to enrich the information as it goes through the flow again. After the lawyer is happy with it, it would then go to the client. Now the client has two options here. They can decline to accept it, which means they can then send it back with comments back to the lawyer for further iterations. Um, and then the lawyer uploads it and it goes back to the client again. And the client can once again say, no, not quite right. And it can keep going around this loop as many times as the client and the lawyer would like. Um, and then once the client is happy, that would uh, trigger uh, it to be sent back to the paralegal um, uh, the information would then be archived um, and uh, the final stage would, uh, of the workflow would be to notify the two accounts to send the invoice uh, and close out the task in this system. Now, in parallel to all of this, uh, which I didn't want to kind of uh, make a further mess of this diagram, there would be a dashboard reporting on the status of, of this flow, but also all the other in parallel workflows that are going on. Because if you had this system, uh, you would hope that it's not just serving a, a single flow at a time. You might have hundreds of these flows going on in parallel, all at different stages, all being sent to different paralegals, uh, different lawyers, all being requested by different uh, clients, uh, but potentially all going to the same accounts person at the end as an example. So as you can see, uh, if I run through at a high level summary, the different capabilities that this, um, this workflow demonstrates, um, you can see it's collecting data from multiple people and systems as it goes throughout uh, the workflow. Um, the, the data is being assessed and enriched. In particular, the Word file is generated after the client submits the original set of information. Um, which is a form of enrichment. And then as the data goes through, it is being assessed. So for example, at the decision point where the client has to say yes or no, um, the data is therefore being assessed and determined, well, what do I do with it next? Uh, it is notifying users uh, using email and push consistently. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we can also use SMS as well. Um, and, uh, and there would be kind of a, a layer of reporting that covers this entire process um, and includes any other in parallel processes that are happening to give the owner of this workflow complete visibility about what would be happening. Data uh, is being exported and imported regularly with the Word file being uh, sent to the next user uh, and enriched and uploaded again by each stage or, or different users throughout this flow. Um, and potentially, uh, this process could be further optimized with data being uh, automatically updated in, say, matter or project management systems, um, and of course, uh, invoicing systems at the very end of the process. Um, and users and roles is definitely being utilized. In this case, we've got clients, we've got lawyers, we've got paralegal, and we've got accounts. So we've got four different user types, um, and arguably, uh, the lawyer, the paralegal, and accounts, uh, and the client. Um, could all actually be groups of users. Um, you know, if, if this law firm in this scenario was working with a large uh, client, it's highly likely that the client would have multiple users. So that's a bit of an example workflow just to kind of set the scene for what Fliplet can uh, assist organizations with. So now let me go through in a little bit more detail our underlying uh, infrastructure that can support workflows, just in case you're thinking, well, that's an interesting workflow, Ian, but what other capabilities does Fliplet have? So uh, let's start with security, a very important point, particularly when you're dealing with corporate information. So we can support uh, self-serve registration, for in this case, for example, the client could sign up on their own if, uh, if the workflow app wanted to support it. Uh, login, uh, critical. We also support single sign-on, uh, and most large organizations want single sign-on to integrate with Active Directory uh, or Okta. We also support encryption capabilities. Um, so the data, if it's highly sensitive, can be encrypted and passed through different stages of the system without being decrypted. And it's only decrypted when the next user that has the appropriate rights loads it. Um, uh, security of the stages can be controlled using our advanced security rule system. So for example, uh, you might say, well, lawyers are only able to access these stages in the process. If you are not a user type lawyer, you cannot access these stages. Um, and I anticipate that that in the previous example would be quite uh, common. 
We've already spoken a bit about user roles. Um, and, uh, and then the final aspect that's worth mentioning is uh, Flipflip, because it supports mobile apps, can also utilize the biometric capabilities that most mobile devices offer these days. So biometrics is generally things like touch ID or face ID, um, which can just help to add additional security, add additional uh, verification. Uh, maybe you could ask people at key points in the workflow um, to actually verify that they want to continue with this workflow, maybe proceed to the next stage, which might uh, incur a payment or something like that. And that that process uh, only occurs once the biometric security is passed. Okay, so then next stage, we've got input. So forms, which uh, is probably what most people would expect. You've also got um, the ability to collect signatures. You can use the camera on devices or even the webcam if you want to collect data directly from the user. Um, uh, camera is quite often used when people are reporting real world issues. Um, so for example, uh, I'm on a, I'm a customer site. Uh, there's a problem, I wanna take a photo of it. That is a critical piece of data that would go into the workflow. You can also upload files as we previously saw. Um, a number of customers are now starting to also use barcodes or QR codes um, as input to trigger different stages in the workflow. Um, and of course, because mobile devices are location aware, you can also use the GPS data that uh, uh, mobile apps and, and web apps have access to, to kind of trigger different stages as well. Uh, storage, um, so uh, data can be stored on the device, uh, data can be stored on Flipplet, data can be sent to databases or APIs, so we've got a whole broad set of storage uh, uh, capabilities. We've spoken quite a bit about notifications already, um, so we've already mentioned email, push and SMS. Um, Time to notifications are becoming a lot more popular. So this is where a workflow needs to have data put into it at a certain point in time. And what we do is we tap into uh, kind of timed notifications, particularly on mobile devices, to pop up little alerts saying, hey, it's 9 a.m. on Monday. Don't forget to tell us about uh, how busy you are this week in case we've got any, any work we'd like you to be doing. Um, and of course, you've got uh, in-app notifications. So in-app notifications are the types of notifications that are quite popular with uh, social media sites, where you get a whole list of notifications that um, are potentially of interest to you um, that have been sent to you when you weren't using the app. Um, so you could also call in-app notifications, almost like the notification log, so you can go back and see what was sent to you previously. Uh, there are a number of, of different types of enrichment. The, the main one is humans. So humans reviewing the information that came from a previous stage in the workflow and uh, updating it or, or in, enriching it. Um, but as I mentioned, you can also use software uh, with the example of postcodes or, or zip codes that I mentioned earlier. And then finally, output. So I've spoken a bit about files already. You can also output to other systems, um, which is uh, very uh, common. Um, you can also send data to other apps, particularly on mobile devices. So for example, if I, if I wanted um, a WhatsApp message to be sent to somebody at a certain point in, in one app, I can tap a button, it'll, it'll open up WhatsApp and say pre-populate the message that I should be sending maybe to the client or, or somebody else. And then finally, uh, the entire set of data, usage data that's occurring throughout the workflow can be written to analytics, which can be useful for further analysis and optimization uh, of the workflow. Uh, and also to help you to analyze where people are getting stuck, um, maybe where people spend a lot of time in the workflow versus other stages of the workflow where they, they're doing, uh, they're spending less time or it's getting less usage. So I mentioned at the beginning, we were gonna talk a little bit about how Fliplet compares. So um, you've heard quite a lot about what Fliplet's capabilities are, and I've listed them on the left-hand side of this chart. But what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna talk a little bit about how Fliplet compares to other tools that you might be utilizing already for workflow or considering for workflow. Um, so let's start with uh, workflow tools such as K2, Bright, and Yoda, et cetera. Now, I just wanna be clear, this isn't an extensive set of analysis. It's just high level to point out where Fliplet kind of fits in the mix. Um, and of course, uh, you know, your experience may be different and it probably depends on, on your level of um, knowledge and obviously uh, what your colleagues' preferences are uh, when producing workflow apps as well. But if you're comparing Fliplet to K2, uh, Bright, and Yoda, et cetera, um, uh, their benefits are that they are typically no code or low code. Um, they're predominantly focused on no code. Um, uh, they have limited design capabilities, whereas Fliplet has extensive design capabilities. Um, they're typically web only. They don't produce native apps, um, which means you don't get a lot of those native app capabilities that I've mentioned throughout this presentation. Um, their feature set is limited to what they generally offer, again, because they're primarily focused around being uh, no code or low code. Um, 
the limited extensibility in some scenarios, you cannot extend these tools with code. Um, so you're stuck with whatever the standard feature set is. Um, but one of the benefits of having limited extensibility is it's, they have a low maintenance cost and a low maintenance of risk. So moving on to app builders, uh, common app builders are Power Apps, Mendix, Xamarin, uh, with uh, Xamarin and Power Apps both being Microsoft products. Um, these tools are, are intended to be uh, low code. Um, they may require designers. Um, because they are low code, you also will typically need somebody who's quite technical, at least to be able to learn them. Um, uh, they do generally produce mobile and web apps, but some of them have limited distribution capabilities. So for example, in some of these tools, you can produce apps that can be distributed on standalone app stores, but sometimes the only way to access the app on mobile is through a viewer app. Because these are low code or designed to be extended by technical people, they are highly extensible. Um, and with that extensibility comes a medium uh, maintenance cost and a medium maintenance risk. Um, so what I mean by medium maintenance cost and risk is if something goes wrong, the amount of time required is likely to be higher than with the previous set of tools that I mentioned. And then finally, you've got custom code. So this suggests that you're just hiring a developer or you're using your in-house development team and they're writing a .NET application or they're writing an iOS or Android app. And so this definitely requires developers and designers. It's the slowest out of the bunch because the code has to be written from scratch. Testing is, is, uh, has to be very exact and very low level. Um, uh, typically, if you're, if you're using these, you're only producing for a single platform. So you don't get your app to run across web and mobile. You would typically have to produce multiple versions of your app if you wanted it across multiple platforms. The benefit is they're highly extensible. Um, they're, they're the most extensible solution because your developer can literally do anything they want. Um, but because of this uh, very uh, low level control, it also means that the maintenance cost and the risk is at its highest. Um, so what we generally find with Fliplet, now just to kind of compare us, um, Fliplet is a no-code, low-code tool. We're highly extensible on design. Um, we do produce native apps on iOS and Android, and we let you distribute them anywhere you want. Um, we also su support web apps on mobile and desktop, as I've mentioned. We have enterprise-grade security with flexible encryption. Our licensing model compared to some of these other tools is, is quite simple. Um, uh, Fliplet app supports offline and online. Um, and I just want to make a note that uh, particularly when you're using workflow apps, you may not necessarily want a part of the workflow to be able to be done offline uh, because it's really important that the data gets up to the server and maybe sent to the next user in the workflow. Um, so uh, you can toggle that feature on and off. Um, uh, it's generally easy to integrate Fliplet with existing systems such as APIs and databases. Um, and because Fliplet is providing a lot of these capabilities out of the box, um, we take care of a lot of the maintenance and therefore the risk. So generally customers have low maintenance um, costs and uh, low maintenance risk. So let's move on to some case studies now. So firstly, I'm gonna talk about a, a customer who produced a fleet management app. And the reason why I picked fleet management app is because it's a fairly easy workflow for us to understand. It's kind of fleet management is related to mileage, uh, vehicle inspections, things like this. Um, and I think most of us have done a, a mileage claim at one point in our career. Um, this organization in particular had 800 vehicles in their fleet. Um, and so you can imagine that the fleet management team is quite, quite busy trying to stay on top of all of their vehicles, uh, not only the state of their vehicles, like were any damaged, um, but also uh, what needed to be done to those vehicles, such as servicing, uh, MOT, uh, is the lease coming up uh, to expire soon and it's gonna be replaced, et cetera. So this app had uh, a login. Um, as a byproduct of logging in, the workflow app would then load the previous mileage data automatically into the app to make it a lot easier for a user to switch vehicles. Um, and it would also pre-populate all of the vehicle settings. So that's an example of data being enriched. Then uh, the user can collect, capture mileage data as they use the vehicle. Now, we did our best to optimize the user interface and validation to reduce the amount of time somebody spent entering mileage data. So this would automatically recall the last mileage entry and put that into the, the from 
uh, mileage field. Um, and it would also do its best to use GPS data to, to kind of um, uh, attach the latitude and longitude or GPS information to any mileage claims, just in case there were any discrepancies, we could fall back to the GPS data to kind of say, oh yes, all right, so you're right. You, you did do a typo when you put that mileage in. You, it, you definitely traveled over 20 miles that day. We can tell by the GPS coordinates. You would also be able to collect uh, vehicle condition information. So this meant that the fleet managers didn't have to kind of travel to all of the different sites and constantly look at the vehicles to ensure that, that every vehicle was still in a safe condition. Um, and if issues were reported, they were automatically escalated up to the fleet manager uh, and the fleet manager was used to type. Um, any data submissions were online only. There was no point the app telling the user, I've successfully submitted your data if it actually had cached it locally and was waiting to submit it to a later point in time. Because in this case, they might uh, immediately submit the data and go and get into a new vehicle. Um, and so we needed the fleet managers to have up to the date, uh, up to the second uh, correct data. So uh, submission was restricted to be online only. And then finally, the fleet management team had a set of reports. So they had dashboards with charts, metrics, and filtering, so they could kind of drill into the state of the fleet. Um, but also they had compliance reporting, notifying them of when leases were expiring, when MOT or, or other critical services were required. So that's the fleet mileage uh, workflow app. Now let me tell you about a, a kind of a new uh, workflow that we're building into our return to office app. Um, if anybody was on the return to office app call last week that Fliplet ran, um, you may already be familiar with this use case. Um, so Fliplet is currently building an app that enables people to book desks as they return to office uh, due to the lockdown imposed by COVID-19. Um, so this ultimately is designed to enable staff to request desks, but also for office managers to ensure that the capacity of office um, is uh, not stretched beyond its means uh, and social distancing is enforced. So it's a pretty simple workflow. Uh, the first is um, that uh, office floors and optionally desks are configured in the app by the office manager. So office manager is a user role in this case. Then uh, staff uh, can request desks via the app. Requests go automatically into a waiting list like a hold state um, staff can see their requests via a screen called My Bookings, and notifications are sent to the office manager um, that a new request has been made and could they please review it. So that's, that's kind of triggering the next stage in the workflow. Uh, bookings are then uh, approved or declined by the office manager. Again, they can use the mobile or the web app to do this, and, and as soon as they've made a decision, a notification is sent back to the staff member. Um, so I anticipate in this scenario that most uh, uh, requests will be approved, um, but occasionally they might need to be declined for whatever reason. Maybe additional cleaning has to occur on a floor, for example. Um, and in that case, the office manager needs a fast, efficient way to tell everybody who uh, has, has a booking or has made a booking request that they will not be able to, to kind of come into the office. Next, because there's no point knowing that somebody intends to come into the office if we don't actually know did they come into the office? So we're going to be having a staff check-in and check-out capability. So um, this will use either QR code scanning on the entrance to various spaces in the office so that we know exactly where you've checked in. Um, and in some offices, such as not high-rise offices, uh, GPS can be utilized as well. Um, and um, people can check into either individual floors or in some organizations, they'll be literally scanning a barcode that's, that's been um, stuck to the desk to verify that I am actually checking into this specific desk. And then the office manager will have access to a dashboard, which they will be able to view the, the uh, office check-in status and booking data in real time for every office and every space or floor in that office. So as you can see, it's quite um, a simple to wrap your head around uh, workflow, but it's very extensive. And I'm sure that you can probably think of a number of other uh, scenarios where this type of workflow would be relevant in your organization. So I promised I was going to tell you how to get started, but I also promised that I wasn't going to give you a demo of, of Fliplet because that would use more time than we, we have available. So for those of you who are familiar with Fliplet, these are the, this is the process that I recommend that you go through. Uh, and for those of you who would like to find out more about Fliplet, maybe receive a demo, please get in touch. But the steps that I've suggested are, firstly, familiarize yourself with Fliplet because you'll need to use screens, forms, and data sources in order to produce a workflow app. 
The next is document your workflow. So this means, uh, and this I would recommend you do this outside of Flipplet. Um, so this means documenting your inputs and your outputs and your processes for each of the key stages in your workflow. You can document them using a flow diagram like I did earlier, um, or you could just use a, a spreadsheet or a, a Word document, whatever you're comfortable with. Next, I would prototype the flow in a Flipplet app. Um, uh, I would just use text or example files to demonstrate processes and outputs because you can then take that prototype and you can show um, it to stakeholders and ask them for their feedback. If they love it uh, and they, they assume that it's all gonna work, that's a great sign. If they start giving you critical feedback about changes they want, it's a good thing you didn't overinvest in the prototype stage. Um, once you've received feedback, integrate the, the missing uh, code or processes um, and Fliplet has an upcoming code library that may be able to assist you um, to, to do some of the more complicated uh, low code capabilities. Um, once you're ready, you can then test the app via Fliplet Studio and Fliplet Viewer. So Fliplet Studio is our online app building tool that's primarily used for computer and Fliplet Viewer is a mobile app that's available in the app stores and gives people instant access to the mobile apps they've built with Fliplet. Um, after uh, the app is passed and you're happy with it, you can then deploy it to the app stores uh, via your MDM or enterprise app store and of course web. Um, and I briefly mentioned the code snippet library. So the code snippet library, which is available on code.fliplet.com, which is online right now, if you're interested to have a look at it while we're going through the webinar, um, it will include code snippets that cover a broad range of categories that are printed down the side of this slide. And the whole idea behind this is to make uh, customizing Fliplet with custom code to do really unique actions, really easy. You just go there, you find the code snippet you want, you copy it, you paste it, you tweak it, off you go. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, uh, Dan, who's gonna walk us through a bit about uh, how Sente um, uh, think of, of uh, business process and workflow apps. Thank you very much, uh, Ian. Thank you uh, indeed, everybody. Um, so what I'll do is quickly run through a little bit about uh, who Sente are for, uh, for those who don't know us. Uh, I know there's a few familiar faces uh, on the call, so, so that's great. Uh, I'm then going to talk a little bit about a couple of use cases that uh, we put together uh, with Flipflip. Uh, we've been a Flipflip partner since the beginning of Flipflip's partnership program, which was two weeks ago. So, uh, so our experience has been, uh, has been informal up until now. Um, and then I'm going to talk through um, just a couple of considerations that, uh, that we've developed in our time using Flipflip. There will be things to help you think about whether Flipflip is a good tool for the use case that you have in mind. Uh, and also I'll be mentioning a couple of the other tools that we use, um, which we're frequently um, comparing Flipflip against, uh, and how that comparison starts to, uh, to stack up. Uh, so you can think about that as well. Um, obviously with the, the view that if you need help with, with that discussion or um, the decision making as to, to what tool to use, uh, Sente Advisors is, uh, is here to help with that. Uh, so firstly, uh, who, are, uh, who are Sente Advisors? Um, we tend to work as an extension of innovation and, uh, and KM teams. We partner closely with, uh, with those organizations, that component of an organization, to provide a, a sort of a technical step into the business, especially in organizations where uh, access to the IT department is limited, uh, IT is, uh, is busy keeping the lights on, uh, and new technology, things like low-code platforms, uh, are providing their, uh, their resources for, for development of new ideas uh, and meeting client or, or loyal demand. We come from an extensive uh, background uh, of law firms. Uh, we've got uh, uh, previous experience with, um, from Norton Rose, uh, from Fragman. Uh, I previously worked at Slaughter and May, and I know my old boss is on the call at the moment, making me extra nervous uh, for some reason. Um, we also work with uh, a previous range of vendors. I spent six years working at HiQ. Um, we've got experience working uh, in senior levels of, uh, of Neota Logic as well, and I see some former employees uh, from, from them on the line as well, which is great. So our new job is to sort of bridge that gap between the legal department or legal uh, KM and innovation teams and the technology vendors, especially when it comes to business processes, which is why I suspect uh, that uh, Ian invited me onto this call today. Uh, our main approach is, is through prototyping. Um, there are, as I'm sure you're aware, a huge range of legal technology platforms out there. Ian has mentioned a couple here today. There is even more than that that we can potentially compare to. Um, the reason that we ended up talking to Fliplet was a recommendation from, from one of our clients. Um, so we try to keep tabs on as many of those tools as possible and provide the best possible options for delivering a particular project. So we prototype those ideas out. 
we will always endeavor to use the tools that a firm has on hand, first of all. But of course, if there is an absolute slam dunk technology out there, uh, then we will try to prototype in that as well. And that's where a couple of the use cases I'm going to talk about today come from. Um, but we also have this extensive sandbox of technologies on hand. So of course, Neota and TyQ uh, become uh, two of one as we previously worked with them. But we've used platforms like Mintex, Checkbox, uh, Microsoft Power Apps, or uh, Microsoft um, Power Automate, as Microsoft Flow is now known, uh, Auto, uh, to do business process work in the past. Uh, we also use tools like Mendix for low-code application, uh, Lauren for chatbots, which have those kind of business flows built into them, uh, and a whole range of others as well. So uh, if you're thinking of any of those tools uh, and you're looking as to where your process might fit uh, on that uh, the spectrum that I'll talk about in a second, um, then feel free to ask us, of course. And of course, the next step is it's very rare that one of these uh, solutions is going to be a single uh, panacea to solve a problem. So we spend a lot of time combining these technologies to create a uh, client-facing solution. Uh, that might be as simple as integrating Active Directory or single sign-on uh, to get your users into the platform. That might involve pulling data from multiple um, data sources, either internal or via APIs. That might be embedding your applications in other applications to create a singular user experience. Uh, or merging workflows where one application has to talk or pass notifications or triggers to another. And that's all part of our plan to help scale innovation to uh, help scale innovation departments, uh, to help build that innovation flywheel, to get ideas generated, get them back to lawyers as quickly as possible, uh, and to help them build a reputation for those innovation or KM teams. So, you know, we're, we're pretty quiet at the moment. The, um, the way we think about low code uh, is, is next. Uh, and so uh, Ian kind of summarized it quite nicely. We, we tend to use three categories, um, one of which uh, is sort of the, the simpler end uh, around the idea of collecting and presenting data. Um, so this is simple examples like registration or feedback forms where you're, you're collecting the data or you're presenting something simple that's going into a database and then it's being processed en masse later on. Uh, there's no immediate notification other than perhaps some email triggers that are going out from that. Um, sales enablement tools are another good idea where you've got data preloaded into a database uh, and users are going to interact with it via searches or filters. Um, directory apps as well where you've got a list of users or a list of regulations that users want to be able to search and filter through. So that's what we call sort of the data driven category. The next step up is where there's more uh, live back and forth. So one thing leads to another. Um, so that's the workflow category. Uh, there are a lot of apps built specifically for this and I'll talk about a few of them. Um, but this is where when you take in some data, either a data point generated programmatically or from an end user, it immediately triggers some action and that action has to trigger another action. Uh, and there's usually some waiting involved, there's perhaps some branching, some, some logic involved, some decision tree that perhaps needs to be followed. So in-tech forms are a great idea here where you're routing data that's coming in from, uh, from one user uh, to an appropriate user, some decisions are taken and a back and forth ensues. Collaborative drafting being another, another good example as well. And then the last step, uh, of course, uh, heavily influenced by, by Neotologic here is an advisory category. This is where you normally have a much larger pool of data, a much larger pool of potential outcomes, and you need some kind of fuzzy methodology in order to get to an outcome or an answer. So chatbots tend to fall into that category, online self-assessment, especially against complex regulation sets, where the questions that will be asked will vary or differ depending on um, the nature of the, of the the answer you're looking to get towards. Uh, of course, this is a, a lovely uh, framework to start working from. There is almost more gray area here than there is um, actual structure, but it gives us a good starting point for thinking about the type of solution that our clients are working with, and that can help push us towards which solution is most likely uh, to be uh, uh, to work to, towards the solution. So why flip it? Why, uh, why are we working with, uh, with this tool? Um, so as I mentioned, we were introdu introduced by a, uh, a US client we were working with who recommended the platform. Uh, so thank you for that introduction. Um, we were evaluating the tool against uh, a couple of other platforms that they already had and were evaluating. Uh, and as we started to play with it, we realized how closely Flipflip aligns with uh, the methodology that Sentai uses as part of our, uh, our innovation program. We are heavily reliant on um, prototyping followed by iterative development uh, and a steady increase uh, of users and adoption over the course of, uh, of our project. Flipflip is fantastic for that. Uh, if, you, if you haven't had a chance to play with it, uh, Flipflip comes with a wide array of templates to start with, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. 
it can get you a good portion of the way towards giving something to your lawyers uh, right away when they've asked for a solution that they can immediately start playing with that's, uh, that's tangible. And of course, that can help them uh, understand whether or not the thing that they think they want is the thing that they actually want. And then, of course, you can start iterating through that process. Uh, and a loco tool makes that iteration process much less painful as well. For us, the other part, of course, is flexibility is key. Uh, when you're working with lawyers, their opinions, their decisions uh, may well change very quickly throughout a project. Being able to make changes to a platform um, is critical. As I mentioned, that low-code functionality is very powerful for that. When we reach the limits of what that functionality uh, can do for us, the ability for us to take an extra step into using JavaScript, HTML, and CSS allows us to make some of those more, uh, uh, more major, more sweeping, or even more minor changes uh, but that require code so that we can keep up with uh, the demands of the project. And the other big metric that Sente uses, especially when we rely on so many different technologies, is the, the play nice with others score. Um, no legal tech is an island. We need to be able to easily flip between different applications. Users may have a journey that involves clicking through different technologies. Uh, we may need single sign-on. We may need a quick way to get data from external databases, things like Adder, Interleet, or Compulor. Can we present that data into the application easily? Can I load it happily into an iframe and have it presented in an existing client portal platform? Again, some bias there after my experience at IQ. Um, but all of these things are important considerations, and, uh, and Clipplet uh, passes muster on all of these. Um, can it also send emails on demand? Can, uh, can we send, uh, can we send uh, also easy notifications? And most importantly, is there a focus on the user experience uh, and the user interface? Um, one of the big comparisons that we talk about is, uh, is those workflow tools. Many workflow tools, from an end user perspective, look like workflow tools. Um, Flipler offers uh, a UI first approach, um, which is exceptionally important, especially if you're building client facing applications. Um, the fact that you can do that very quickly is a huge boon for us. So, where do we use Flipler? Um, I'm not biased here. Um, I'm a little biased here, but it's definitely my favorite uh, for the data driven use cases that I mentioned to start with. Um, if you can very quickly drag and drop some components onto a Flipper page, uh, that's your forms, some of your headings, uh, some of the uh, ancillary uh, user experience pieces that go along with that. You want a quick single sign on page dropped in. You can use a template or build from scratch, and you can have a, a, a data capture app or a data presentation app uh, in a day. Um, of course, the hard part comes with those iterative changes uh, later on, but uh, that's, uh, in most cases, that's a slam dunk for Flipper. Well, I'm a little more circumspective on the, on the workflow side. Again, we've only been using this for, uh, for a month or so now, and we're still getting to grips with, with how it works. But we've started to see a sliding scale where Flipper, uh, at the simpler end of these use cases, uh, is exceptionally powerful, and then your mileage will vary depending on what skills you have available. Um, as to whether or not Flipper is useful in the more complex use, use cases. So I'll talk about some of those considerations on the, on the next slide. Certainly, um, if, uh, if you're at the simpler end though and you've got those, uh, those drag and drop capabilities or you're close to a template that Flipper already has, uh, there may well be a good start, at least perhaps for your first prototype or your first couple of prototypes uh, to help get you closer to, uh, to the solution that you're looking for. If you're looking at use cases um, such as client feedback, where you've got simple routing of uh, the different uh, feedback to different departments, and you want people to, to collect that feedback and act on it, a couple of step use cases. Um, that's a great use case. It's something that can be done in Flipper very easily. Um, it's a use case I'm working with uh, on a couple of uh, clients right now. Uh, again, intake for simple portfolio matters. If you've got a form where uh, people are collecting data, um, from client site, for example, routing into a system, uh, appropriate teams need to respond, generate documents. Uh, that sort of thing is possible, and I've got a use case example of that that I'll talk through uh, as well. The other key consideration is, um, is whether or not speed is of the essence. Obviously, in most cases, it usually is. Um, but again, if you've got uh, something where you need to get something very quickly developed, uh, we find that Flipboard uh, is a great way to get us towards that first tangible uh, point that we can show to the client or to the lawyers. The other thing that um, Ian has mentioned a bit here is the, uh, uh, around the use of a mobile and web app at the same time. Being able to deploy an app to the App Store, have it stay in lockstep with the app that's deployed through a browser or in an iPhone, uh, have a consistent UI or user experience between the two, 
especially if users are offline or away from their desk and need mobile access, uh, it gives uh, Flipflet a huge step forward in those use cases. Um, and the other thing, of course, is I do do a lot of work with, uh, with HiQ, uh, enhancing HiQ portals, being able to very quickly embed um, a Flipflet app into a, uh, an iframe within a wiki or homepage in HiQ to extend the capabilities of client portals, especially in use cases where clients have got single sign-on set up, um, is, uh, is a huge benefit, uh, especially to, uh, to us when we're looking to create uh, extensibility in platforms that have a fairly rigid UI uh, or a rigid feature set. Um, and that's especially helpful considering that HiQ is about to become an identity provider that's going to make that even easier. So some of the considerations to think about. Um, Ian has told me I can be completely honest here, uh, which he absolutely will not come to regret at all. Um, but the, the big one here to think about is that, uh, and Ian did mention it as part of his process, is the idea that um, Flipper doesn't have a workflow editor built into it. Um, it tends to cause users to go, is, is Flipper even a workflow tool at all? Uh, you will have to build uh, your workflow, design your workflow in another separate tool, and you will have to maintain that as the workflow changes or as uh, Flipper changes the workflow with you. So if you've used tools like uh, Nintex or Neotologic Canvas or, or Checkbox, you'll be familiar with the drag and drop um, flowchart. You can drop out the components create the links between the different components. Um, Clipper doesn't allow you to do that. So if you've got um, a business analyst hat you can put on or extra business analyst resources to document your workflow and keep it documented as you, uh, as you build it out, this may well not be a consideration. Um, but as you can see, there's the sliding scale here. Um, it may not be a complete deal breaker, but if your workflow becomes incredibly complex, you've got a large number of steps, lots of actions, lots of triggers, lots of branches, um, as well as a number of changes that will happen over time, then you will have to balance the need to keep that documentation up to date um, with the need uh, to have the, the slick UI that, that will be the balancing point for, uh, for Flipflip there. The other big you to think about here is, uh, and uh, Ian has alluded to it a little bit, if you're going to use uh, a workflow that requires logic, you are going to have to, to get used to, uh, to copying and pasting at the very least some JavaScript. Uh, Flipper requires code in most cases for, for, um, for your workflow use cases. Uh, most clients that we work with don't have immediate access to developers uh, and would be a little reticent when it comes to, to, to coding in JavaScript. Obviously, that's possibly the reason why they, uh, they work with us. That allows us to add that sort of expandability on top of uh, their capabilities. If you aren't comfortable with coding uh, at all, then you are going to have to take a look at the, uh, the Flipflet uh, code library. Uh, it's a fantastic document uh, library, and it's, it's very well laid out. Um, and see if you're happy with copying and pasting that kind of code into the, the Flipflet code editor. A simple example of this would be when it comes to things like hiding fields, if you've got uh, dynamic forms that you want to be able to showcase uh, within your workflow, uh, a platform like Mendix, uh, which is almost a, a programming language in its own right, has a very comprehensive visual editor for form conditionality. You select your condition, you select the variables, you select the enumeration of selections for checkboxes, et cetera, uh, and it will build out your, your flexible form for you. Uh, whereas a platform that's more workflow focused like checkbox gives you a, a little field where you can copy and paste in your, your form logic. You still need to understand uh, the, the logic itself and, and the concept of variable names, um, but it's not actually sort of code. Flip, of course, you'll need to copy and paste JavaScript uh, in, but again, that's, uh, in most cases, that's something you can copy and paste from the code library. So your mileage will vary there depending on where you see yourself on that particular spectrum. The other considerations are when you're integrating um, Flipflip, platforms like Auto or Nintex will come with pre-built Zapier like Zaps. You can drag and drop in different integration pieces to push and pull data from things like uh, Azure, uh, Google, Slack, et cetera, to create those kind of triggers. There aren't many pre-built integrations in any of these platforms when it comes to sort of more common legal tech tools or legal tech specific tools. So you are going to need to be able to poke around with APIs almost regardless of which tool you use. Uh, so Flipbook there is, is no exception. And most tools will require something else, uh, an extra component when you're pulling data from your, uh, within your firewall as well, internal databases. Uh, many of them will have their own appliance like HiQ, Flipflet's no exception there. Their data integration service allows you to pull data from your, your internal database. Anytime you're doing this, though, of course, you're going to need to work with your IT department. Punching holes in firewalls is something that makes everybody nervous. 
So you've just got to make sure that, uh, that that's a consideration. There will be some significant lead time uh, if you're going to do anything involving local data. Uh, another thing to consider is Doc Auto. Um, Ian's made it very, sound very easy. I mean, we all know if we've done anything with, with any tool that Doc Auto is a, a pain in the behind. So depending on your level of Contract Express, uh, you will, uh, your mileage will vary again depending on how difficult you find. Uh, adding the JavaScript code, first of all, in Clipboard, uh, and then coding the documents. Um, the difference there is, is not huge, of course, uh, but it's something to consider. And then my last bullet point at the bottom here was after a, uh, a long evening putting together a complex form for one of the use cases I'll talk about in just a sec. Uh, I managed to build a comprehensive, uh, flexible, dynamic form uh, in the system. You very much have to make sure you scroll all the way to the bottom and click save before you get tempted by the inviting preview button at the top of Fliplet. Uh, otherwise, you are likely to lose the last 40 or so minutes of your work and some choice curse words may erupt uh, if, uh, if that happens. Uh, apparently, I've already uh, leveled this one in, and he says that it's on the roadmap to have a are you sure you wish to do this uh, prompt uh, in, in future. So with all this trade offs mentioned, the consideration here is the user experience piece uh, is important. Um, if you are building something that is UI UX first, if the look and feel of the specific workflow apps doesn't work for you, then you can absolutely use uh, Fliplet instead with the knowledge that uh, the considerations above uh, are something that you've thought about. So really quickly then, two use cases that I put together just uh, as an example of, uh, uh, of the flexibility and mostly the speed of Flipper as well. One of which was an idea that, uh, that came from uh, somebody who is uh, who's on the call at the moment. Uh, the idea was uh, a way of keeping track uh, of who was coming into the office uh, when people needed to pick up paper files, for example, so that we could create an audit trail for, um, for contact tracing if we needed it uh, and to know uh, who had been uh, on site. Uh, Flippant's directory gave me pretty much 80% of the groundwork of this. We then added a drag and drop simple form onto the front end so that users could very quickly come into the office. When they were doing that, they just hit the button to say yes, they were coming in that day. That was all they needed to do. Um, it could be integrated with single sign-on so that users didn't even have to worry about authentication. And that could send a notification trigger uh, through the database to the administra administration team. They could then get a quick feel for how many people were coming in. They could send emails back if they needed to, to to warn people about volumes in the office, but it also kept an audit trail uh, to make sure that we could then respond if there was a confirmed outbreak. We knew the contact people we could track and trace from every single day. And then the last use case uh, is another example of something more complex around uh, intake. Um, this is a, a red tech example where users uh, on the client side could add new real estate um, that they were adding to a portfolio. This was around timeshares. Uh, the idea that they would be able to come into the application, register new properties uh, from their local, from their tablet while they were on site uh, as they were adding them to the portfolio. There was a simple dynamic form to do that. Depending on the type of form, uh, it would then trigger uh, an alert to go to uh, a legal team depending on the type of license that they were looking to either acquire or renew. And of course, that then plugged into document automation tools so those licenses could be generated automatically, sent back to the client through the app, uh, and they would have their, their new licenses within 24 hours. So I'll give us five minutes. I've seen a couple of questions popping up. So I will, uh, I will turn it back over to, uh, to Ian to lead that. Uh, but thank you very much indeed. Excellent. Thanks, Dan. That was fantastic. I really appreciated the level of detail you went in there and, and also the other uh, examples you were able to share from other technologies. That was appreciated. Um, Chris, do we have any... Yeah, Chris, do we have any uh, uh, questions that uh, have been posted? In yeah. That? yeah, we've got a few, which is good. Um, so to start, start with Ian, um, if you can just explain where does the data reside? Yeah, so this is really quite flexible, and, um, uh, and I, I mentioned this a little bit kind of in some of the latest slides. So data can reside on Fliplet, and if it's being stored on Fliplet, depending on the level of sensitivity, you may wish to add additional encryption. Uh, although by default, all data stored on Fliplet is encrypted. Um, you can also store data on-premise, um, and uh, the data integration service that Dan mentioned in his slides uh, is a little tool that we offer that allows you to take data that's been uploaded into Fliplet and sync it down to uh, on-premise data storage. Um, uh, Dan and I have also been working on recently, uh, you know, whether or not we can use some existing legal tech tools such as HiQ iSheets to actually uh, store data uh, and not only therefore uh, make the data available to Fliplet, but also make the uh, data available in Haiku, which, which could add additional capability. So um, I think 
the, in summary, the answer is it's very flexible. Superb, thanks Ian. A uh, couple more. So do the workflows include approvals and escalations? Yeah, yeah. So um, the, the workflows can include approvals and escalations. Dan, have you had any experience in, um, I guess it's probably more in the real estate one, did you have to have any approval stages or is it just if the data was submitted, it's fine? Yeah, so you can certainly have that triage step where it goes to a, a screen in the app where a user can make their, their judgment call. If you haven't uh, pre-built the logic around this yet, where you could ha have a, a button that just says, uh, no, this, this isn't viable for me, I can't do this. Uh, one of the fields we had in the app was a, a sort of a deviations from standard field where if there was anything non-standard about the transaction, it could then go to uh, a pop-out field that would allow the user who was triaging it to make a decision. So they could then say, actually, because of the way this is uh, rooted, escalate this and it would send a, a trigger up the chain to the partner who was managing that, uh, that client. Excellent. Thanks, Dan. Brilliant. Thank you both. A um, bit of a longer one here. So in the NDA example you gave Ian, mm -hmm. does the app track and document the back and forth comments and edits between clients and lawyers? Yeah, so it, it's, um, it's not intended to be a replacement for track changes or anything like this, but um, it's, it, uh, the idea is that each stage of the workflow would record a new version of the app. And um, obviously data could be put into the file, such as the form of track changes, um, or it could be stored uh, as part of the information that is uploaded when the file gets uploaded, such as comments or notes. I anticipate, um, that most organizations would probably want to use both. They would want uh, uh, comments directly in the document where they can be very, very specific, but then probably a summary that goes along with the document and gets um, and is part of the email notification that gets sent to different parties. Dan, do you have anything to add there? Um, obviously, I'll come biased towards HiQ here a little bit there. HiQ is, is one of the platforms that would allow that kind of collaborative back and forth with the collaborative drafting. Um, HiQ could do the integration then with your with your iManage system as well. So you do the the editing piece offline uh, away from the client facing component. When the document is ready, you could then create a trigger from HiQ using something like their file metadata solution that would then run the API uh, code which would fire the document back to present it in Flipnet. So you can take that away from the front end uh, and do that in another tool uh, and then sync it back when you're ready. Yeah, that's a great that's a great suggestion. You can mix the tools up as well as you say. Are there any other questions, Brilliant. Chris? Yeah, thank you both. So for one final question, and it was on your last slide, Dan, but didn't really mention it too much, so I'll, I'll give you a chance to answer it, Ian. Um, again, in the MDA process uh, you showed, can you include electronic signatures? Yeah, and actually, I think, Dan, you mentioned that you used electronic signatures. Did you use the Fliplet uh, e-signature feature? Uh, in this example, we didn't. If so, we haven't used it that, but we've done DocuSign integrations, of course. Um, that's, uh, that's a nice and easy one. Yeah, and Fliplet does have, uh, because the, um, the fleet manager client that I mentioned earlier, they actually wanted some form of, of uh, digital signature. So Fliplet does offer a digital signature field, um, but I doubt it is anywhere near as uh, legally binding and things like that as using DocuSign or EchoSign or one of the other um, kind of specific uh, signature management tools. Um, Okay, cool. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, and, and thank you, Dan. I'm just going to run through just a, a couple more slides to wrap up. So that concludes today's presentation. If you've liked what you've heard and you'd like to hear a little bit more about Fliplet, we've got a few webinars coming up. So I've got how law firms are using apps, um, case studies from the legal industry on Wednesday, the 27th. Um, we have our information about a new code library coming up on the 28th of May. Um, we have uh, two uh, webinars planned for June, which is increasing the reach of legal tech through integrations. In this, we'll be talking about integrations with HiQ, Miyota, Brighter, et cetera. Um, and we're also going to be talking specifically about marketing apps with a, a partner of ours called Meridian West also in June. So if you'd like to sign up to any of those, please visit the webinars page. So thank you everybody for attending. Uh, bang on time by the looks of things. Um, if you have any further questions, please get in touch with Fliplet or Sente. Um, and uh, we'll be posting the recording of this online soon so you can share it with your colleagues if you think it's uh, relevant to them. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Dan. I really appreciate your support and I hope everybody has a great, uh, great afternoon and evening. My pleasure. Thank you all.